All right. Well, thank you so much for being the first guest. Um, ladies and gentlemen, today we are going to be talking with Georgie. Georgie, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, for sure. Thanks uh, for having me, Ethan. Uh, hey there, my name is Georgie. Uh, I'm currently the communications and marketing manager at the BC Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I run, so my job, my role is primarily focused on running a platform called bcmindreader.com. We are a business insight community. So we have a, a community of uh, over three and a half thousand uh, decision makers in BC. So primarily CEOs, but also senior managers, CTOs, um, and directors, et cetera, et cetera. And these people uh, share their feedback on top issues in BC, and then we collect that data, we analyze it, and we turn it to economic reports and trends that we track over time to see the, how the economy perfor- is performing. So we have uh, we have a very interesting um, community and some of, the, some of the insights that we have uh, we've received, we've been using it to fight COVID and, and uh, lead the economic recovery here in BC and, and nationwide as well. Uh, we, f- for our work on BC Minor, we actually received a uh, customer intelligence award in, uh, I believe it was 2019 or maybe 2018 from Vision Critical. So that was very exciting. Um, as far as we know, we were one of the first chambers of commerce, definitely in North America and uh, maybe the world, but I don't want to make such a bold statement um, to have implemented such a, such a program. So it was really exciting for us to lead the way. And... Um, it's definitely paved. Uh, it's definitely been really different because no other chamber that we know of has. Uh, we're, we're we're kind of like, so chambers of commerce they have different the focuses around the world, right? There are some chambers uh, that just support business and they support the economic development. We are more of a chamber that focuses on advocacy, and working with the government to help remove red tape for business. So how do we help businesses grow? So for example. Um, one of the projects we worked on was um, uh, we worked with a coalition of other organizations to help bring Uber to VC, right? So we have a lot of really cool, interesting projects and always changing. And so we use the platform to uh, to basically, instead of doing our advocacy work in person and in a non-tech way, we digitize it um, and use a lot of applied technology to it, um, data analytics, data science, a lot of AI goes into it as well. And we extract a lot of interesting insights and trends from what businesses are saying about the economy. That's 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 incredible. And some of the stuff that you guys have put forward has definitely changed the local landscape from the sounds of it. I mean, bringing Uber into the province, that must have been a challenge. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely been really interesting. I think uh, the, way, the way I've always looked at it is like, there's a lot of places we can go for objective data. Um, by that, I mean like Stats Canada or something. And they'll just publish the hard and raw numbers. Like, here's how many businesses we have in BC. Here's how many employees are working in the in the tech sector. Or, you know, here's how many, what the average income is or something. We publish this objective data that comes out of, hey, how is your business being impacted? Right? Or, or we figure out trends like, what is the correlation between investment uh, in your organization, whether you invest in people or into technology, and how does that correlate with the, the business's productivity? Or, for example, we did a small case study on which factors, uh, we, we asked some sentiment questions and we had certain list of certain factors. So we asked which factors uh, lead to better uh, CEOs and organizations. So again, that was, <laughs> this is a very rough summary of it, but um, we basically looked at uh, people's how how uh, risk averse people are, or how open they are to changing trends, and then we profiled uh, a set of over fifteen hundred CEOs and executives, and we analyzed that with business productivity. So there's a lot of really cool innovation that we're doing, and some of it is is, is so state of the art that even uh, you know we were. I was trying to find some documents uh, on similar research pub- published from business uh, schools, but there was not nothing that there was nothing that we could find. So, I I think personally that there there's a that's a really interesting space that we've been able to really pilot um, in this kind of I, I would call it gov tech. We're not necessarily government. We're actually not for profit organization, but we work really closely with government. So I would call it gov tech. Um, so that's been really exciting. So, with that being said, 
because you guys go into really specific, almost niches within different small businesses, how would you say getting data from more specific areas and more uh, broad topics has increased the amount of insights that you guys have been able to collect? Well, so we, so, okay. So let me just dial back a bit. When we, we are, uh, so the chamber of commerce, we are a member based organization and we are powered. We're driven by our members in the province. We have about 36,000 members across uh, all of the chambers. We are the provincial chamber. So we, we have some major companies, uh, you know, some pretty, pretty large employers that are our members, but we also support 125 local chambers, right? So the way you think about it, there's, you know, different cities and regions in BC, and there's 125 local chambers, like the Vancouver Board of Trade, the Victoria Chamber, um, the Burnaby Board of Trade, and all of those chambers of commerce, they are our members, and we work together with them to coordinate our efforts and our advocacy work. So then we work together to recruit members onto bcmindreader.com, and uh, we then profile them and ask them what, what they think about the economy, right? So uh, when we when we are looking at how do we get a breadth and depth of voices, we usually, there, there's several ways that we go about doing it, but we usually partner, first of all, with, with our local chambers. We work with them and they send out, you know, campaigns and they recruit members through their uh, local communities. And that's how we get that breadth across the po- province where we, where we have reach into every single corner. Uh, from rural communities like Nakasp to, you know, uh, seventy mile house or something like that, we reach into literally every corner of the province. Every small town that has a postal code, we have a reach there. So it's incredible what we can do, right? Um, in terms of depth, if we are interested in diving deep into into a certain uh, a vertical, like let's call it uh, tech, right? So for tech, we might go and reach out to a certain association or an organization that would work specifically with tech-focused businesses. So it could be the BC Tech Association or you know, BC or any other tech-focused organization. And we might partner with them and work together where they uh, they help bring the members that, that, that we might not have access to or, or bring the, that different perspective that we don't have. And then we work together to make sure we collect rich, rich data. Um, generally we have certain benchmarks that we want, right? At the bare minimum we want, uh, we, we usually poll members, uh, through surveys, but at the bare minimum, for example, we want a 95% confidence central and a 5% margin of error. And then for a sample size of something like BC, you're probably looking at, well, just slightly under 400 responses, but let's call it 400 for, for simplicity's sake, right? And there's different levels that you can go up and uh, get more and more, right? So generally, 400 is the bare minimum, and then we go and go up um, into over 1,000 and 1,500. I think our largest survey had 8,000 responses, and generally we we scored about about 1,000, right? Um, the more data we collect is better for us, right? Because... Well, now we're getting kind of into the nitty gritty of the of the polling stuff, but you know, pulling it up at a provincial data set. If you try to break it down into a local data set, into a into a smaller subset, you want that subset to also have a statistically significant, uh, to be to be statistically significant and have a certain um, uh, margin of error and whatnot that's that's as minimal as possible. So we try to get um, a larger sample size to compensate for that, right? To make sure that we have, you know, if we want to get a really accurate picture of specifically Burnaby or or, or Coquitlam uh, in BC, then we really need, you know, those 350, 400 responses from just Coquitlam or Vancouver. So we, tr- we you know, we, we define certain goals and criteria and then we, we tr- work towards those criteria. And the data we collect, um, the way our database is structured, our members, they... Um, they consent to sharing their their information and their opinion with us, and then they over time, um, while they're members of the community, the more they provide, the more data we can co- connect around that user. So, like say you Ethan here, you're you know you're you're starting a company and you know you you're telling us all of your issues about the economy that you don't like, things that are in your way of growing your business as you're growing your business. And over a year or two, we can track those trends and we can see how that's changing, how your confidence is changing in the economy, 
or in a business, right? So we can actually connect the dots to individual people or individual businesses. And it's very interesting data because it's, it's longitudinal data, right? It's not something like Stats Canada survey or, uh, or even a simple survey monkey where, you know, survey where you're going to just pull somebody and then we're not going to be able to connect the dots between the people. And then, well, where's your longitudinal that data? So now that we start starting to collect that, that starts, that gives us the, the breadth and depth of data, gives us the ability to build some pretty, pretty interesting models um, that, that haven't been built before, right? And so we, a lot of that is used for, um, we share that with our partners so they can make better decisions um, and that, and the government loves that, right? So I think um, at, at the end of the day, uh, as an example of of how much data we have we 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 collect is like we we have this annual survey that we we uh, we run every year. It's called the Collective Perspective Survey, and it's an economic pulse check on the BC economy. So we we it's it's basically the, we're taking the pulse of the economy to see how businesses are doing and what dire needs they have in the in the next year. So usually we identify like top issues and trends, um, like you know. Housing is a housing affordability is a crisis. Um, you know, maybe uh, labor is usually a top issue. Access to labor, cost of labor, taxes, etc. And so we collect that data. And in in um, twenty eighteen, when we ran the survey, I think with our sample, sorry, let me just recall here. I think with our sample, we had about like three hundred pages of data of reports that we created. We ran that survey again a year later with this uh, with the with. Uh, same sample, but but with uh, it actually doubled in size. I would we had an an extra eight hundred people in 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 the survey a year later. But as beside the point. But um, the the amount of data that we produced, the amount of reports that we produced um, from from that survey, same amount of questions and whatnot. Uh, we had three thousand pages instead of three hundred, right? So the data that we had, that we collected in a, in in a year on those members and how we profiled them. It helped us produce and basically have a 10x growth in our data. So, and I can't even imagine where it's at right now. Try <laughs> so it's pretty scary. Um, like how much data we have and and uh, you know how that how that can be used to really you know look look under the hood of the of the economy and see how businesses are running. It's I mean with 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 COVID especially it's it's scary because you're kind of seeing things and you're like. Well, wow, I'm, you know, I'm kind of sad that that businesses are shutting down and and going out of business, and there's people struggling to you know put food on the tables and and pay rent, and you know we have uh, you know businesses business owners telling us like you know we're you know we're going homeless now that we you know we shut down our business and we can't. It's just somebody with a very loud car behind us. <laughs> so yeah, there's business owners saying. We've shut down our business, and we um, we're not sure exactly where we're gonna go from here. So, so you know, sometimes the data, you know, it's, it's good that we have that breadth of data, but it's also sometimes really scary, right? Like in an economic crisis, like what we're in right now, right? It it is very unfortunate that you know, uh, it's it's a balancing act between science and the economy, right? And it's it's a hard choice to make, but you know. Um, especially given today, I guess we have a, a bit of significance because the first vaccines arrived in BC, right? So, yeah, yeah just uh, uh, yeah, just earlier this week. Uh, I mean, it, it's a pretty exciting time, but I mean, I, th- I think at the end of the day, like if you go back, good decisions start with good data. If you have good, if you have, if you have good data, you can make good decisions. If you don't have good data, you can't make good decisions. So we, our platform helps us provide good data to government, so government can make good decisions. And that is that is something crucial, especially right now. Now, here's the question. Do you think with future implementation of tools like AI, we could get even better data than the data we receive right now? I mean, okay, so are you talking about like synthetic data and whatnot? Yeah, for the most part. So we, okay, so we, we are, we have, we, there's, there's been some agencies that have approached us and said, Hey, we know we could create synthetic data, but I think in our line of business, particularly we, we work with people and I think 
people it's really hard to create synthetic data for people because people they there's there's so many outliers among people there's no yeah the people generally follow a, a certain curve or a certain average but you know in between them when you when you try to model them for 50 100 different variables and you know like income and you know employment levels and like their education levels and whatnot when you try to look at all of these uh all this demographic data trying to create a synthetic profile or uh, generate synthetic data becomes really really hard right because it's just the, the possibilities grow exponentially and uh yeah, we we are big proponents of using actual data of of of, uh, of people. So now, with that being said, um, I definitely I, now I'm not an AI specialist, so take this with a grain of salt, right? And you know, I do data data analysis and whatnot. I create reports and look at the trends, but I personally don't think that we our technology is quite there yet for us to be able to generate good and valuable synthetic data. I think there's a lot of, um, there's some places where you could, with a certain level of accuracy, you could plug in the holes, but that's about it. But I don't think we're we get there yet where we could generate subsets of synthetic data. If we could, that would quite literally revolutionize um, yeah, the, the tech world. It would, it, would, it would be truly revolutionary if we could create high, qu high quality being the key here, synthetic data, right? Because you don't need to then, go out to you know collect data off of users phones you don't need to go out there and figure out exactly what ethan moore does and you know all these huge companies there they're installing sensors and they're collecting data off your phone the cookies and browsers everything because at the end of the day user behavior is different from user to user right so the fact that they can track that and can and as long as they can connect that back to the user that becomes really valuable data so um i i don't think they're they would be just going out there to generate random synthetic data if they don't have a good understanding of, of, of the user. Do I think someday the technology is going to get there? For sure. You know, I don't think, I don't want to say 20, 30 years. I think it might even happen earlier, like by 2030, at the pace of, you know, the pace it's going at. But um, the day it comes is definitely going to be quite revolutionary for, for, uh, any technology company, right? Where do you think the bar is for good, good quality data? Um, right now, I think with AI, I think I, I, I definitely agree with you in, in a lot of those points. We aren't there yet, but where do you think the bar would be where then we could say and rely on data that has been collected by a conventional neural network or a different form of automated intelligence like uh, alpha zero or so forth and so forth. Well, one, I, I think the benchmark would be once the synthetic data that it generates, well, first of all, there needs to be some sort of a model, right? So I don't know how, you're still gonna need some sort of real data, but I think once the synthetic data um, passes a test where uh, a certain generated uh, subset is a, it, so okay so that the test would have to pass the decision generated subset would need to be equivalent to the to the test subset that that you're targeting so if you want to take a subset of 100 business owners and you profile them for 50 variables you want to make sure the synthetic data that, it, that, that the program generates is is pretty close to those 50 variables right we're not there yet you're going to have your data is not going to come anywhere near that and the margin of error is going to be ridiculously huge so I think the day that we can actually get that, um, and again, as that grows in size, it becomes exponentially more complex. Um, but I think the reason I'm saying I think it's possible in the next 10, 20 years, I think it, because of advances in quantum computing, I think there, there's going to be a lot of possibilities uh, for us to take it to the next level. It's definitely going to take a while. Um, you know, I think commercially, we're going to see probably quantum computers in like your average bank or something the next 10, 15 years, but something at a, at a laptop or something, it's probably going to take quite a while because of cooling constraints and, 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 and well, I mean, size constraints as well, right? Uh, I think everybody's pretty happy with the tech we have right now. So, but perhaps there's going to be opportunities for, for companies to do offshore, uh, like quantum computing farming or something like that. So you set up data centers and just pro pro process all the data 
offshore and um, quantum, quantum clouds, and then you actually bring it back here for, for the user to see, right? So then I could see that happening quite a lot earlier. Um, but again, with the, with the technology we have right now, it's still insufficient. So we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna need to get through a lot of hurl, hurdles before we get there. And, you know, if I was to take a guess, I really hope 2030, 2040, we could, we could see something incredible there. I mean, with all the, all the amazing breakthroughs that Google has had, and even here in Burnaby, um, D Wave, D Wave, right? D Wave is an incredible company, right? They're yeah. making quantum yeah. leaps here. I remember I toured D Wave, and I was I was so impressed. They're ridiculously huge machines, right? They, but it's so impressive what the work that they're doing. It's 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 mind blowing. No, for sure. So, how do you think the transition will look from traditional? computing over to quantum computing do you think it'll happen in a similar way to how we saw computers transition from you know physical people sitting down and and doing computations uh, to the large massive ibm machines that filled up a room over to like a laptop desktop sort of setup or do you think it'll be an exponential change where when quantum computing becomes mainstream it'll only be able to become mainstream if it's in a small form factor. Well, first of all, <laughs> I'm not a quantum computing specialist. So this, this is just me, you know, um, just h hypothesizing here. And, and uh, so, you know, I don't have a degree in quantum computing, so I can't really tell you. I mean, if I was to look at the trends, I think, um, I, I think that we, uh, Again, I, I, it's really hard to predict innovation, right? The whole th the whole point about innovation is that if you predict it, it's not innovative. If you can predict right. an innovation, then you know you can already build it today. Then it's by definition not an innovation because you can predict it. So you know, if I'd be able to predict exactly what happened, it wouldn't really be innovative, would it? It would it would just be like you know, I'm <laughs> predicting the future. You know, might as well might as well start uh, betting some money on some good stocks. Um, but uh, when I when I when I look at it, I think it's definitely going to follow the same curve because some of the challenges that are facing quantum computing are very different from the challenges facing, um, the, well that we were facing with you know silicon chips, um, but uh, I think that for for the average user, there's not going to be at least at the very beginning, a very huge benefit to using quantum computers over regular computers, right? The the computing power compared to the size and people just like convenience right and you're not gonna unless the, the computing uh, power is 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 so much larger that for you you're somebody like a designer you're a top 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 agency or you know a film producer who needs like top 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 animations or well yeah really truly one of the top professions you're not going to be adopting any of those huge computers because the average you know mom and pop shop or whatever like you know or the average person on the street, they, do they really need that much of a beast at the very beginning? Probably, I, I don't think they do. So it'll, I, I think it'll truly depend on the form factor and form factor and power how those two compete with, uh, with regular computers, right? So. Yeah, no, 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 for sure. I, I think you're on the ball with that one. Now, keep in mind, I'm no quantum computing expert either. <laughs> this is all purely speculation, but... Um, given the theme of the podcast, I think this is the exact type of topic I'm, I'm looking for. I think, um, we are in such a pivotal point in terms of there's so much technology that's being developed right now. And there's so many people out there giving their own speculation on so many different wide varieties of, of, of topics, like using this in a very broad sense. Um, I heard somebody referring to Moore's law or I heard somebody referring to AI as the next Moore's law where uh, AI will develop this, you know, crazy exponential growth and it'll take over Moore's law because of course, uh, people are saying that Moore's law is, is slowly dying now, uh, but you know, but those two, I, are, those two aren't related. Like, I mean, well, no, not, not directly really. Like, I mean, yes, of course, like. AI is going to grow as your processing speed grows. So, you know, if you're processing, if you can process exponentially faster than you, the amount of data you can go through is exponentially faster. So obviously your AI models are going to be exponentially better. But, at the, you know, at the end of the day, I don't, it, it, everything just depends on on our computing ability and, and you know, 
I, I don't necessarily think that... Like, again, at the end of the day, AI has its own issues. It's a completely different field. Yeah, so the very core, the basic, 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 fundamental um, uh, challenge there is the computing power. But when you, know, when you go up beyond that, there's, there's so many more issues that, that they're facing that it's not just about computing power. Like, I mean, some of the challenges we had, we, we weren't facing issues that were related to computing power. It was some of the other issues around the models. Well, particularly the quality of data that we had when we wanted to build our models. That's right. Living in, in a society where uh, a lot of people have the or meet the criteria and barrier to of, of technology in order to to work, you know, from home. Right. Even that a lot of people in society right now aren't able to aren't able to do. Um, well, I mean, that could change really soon. I mean, look at Starlink, right? That's, that's on the horizon. That changed the game. That's true. Well, actually, you know, you make a you make a very good point there. What's your take on on all of this uh, on this idea that more people need to be connected? Oh, I'm a huge supporter of that. I think in the internet has been the greatest equalizer of opportunity for people worldwide. You know, you, you could be anyone anywhere and you have if you have a computer, you could you can build your future, right? So I think I think the internet is the greatest equalizer for all uh, for everyone. It's you have all all the knowledge of all of humanity. It's all in in the palm of your hand now. I mean, with that comes of, co- of course the good and bad. But you know, we're working on on fixing the bad. <laughs> so we have more of the good. But you know, at the end of the day, I think it, it te- technology has been well, the internet specifically. I think has been a great equalizer for 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 uh, different societies now there are within societies though we can look at the class class structure there's been financial well, wealth and equality that happened as a result of certain people gaining the advantage but at the end of the day i think at the bare minimum it provides everybody an opportunity um and then it's a matter of working hard and, and well luck right so some people get lucky some people don't but it, it i think when you, if you compare no no technology, no computer to to technology and computer, there's definitely with with the internet and with the computer, there's way more opportunities that just simply didn't exist. So I think, you know, you, you might say, you might argue that, oh well, you know, the wealth doesn't get distributed equally or something. But even if that's the case, I think, assuming wealth and equality, you still have more opportunity than you did without a computer. Period. Oh, no, for sure. I mean, um, look at how many examples of influential people to this day started with nothing but a primitive PC, right? Or, uh, you know, barely any technology at the palm of their hand. And uh, yeah. Now imagine what happens when, you know, Starlink comes and you have rural connectivity in, in all corners of just even BC, we don't have rural connectivity in some of the rural communities, or it's, it's absolutely garbage. And now imagine if, imagine some of the third world countries where there's, you know, like Africa, there's, there's so many smart and genius people out there that could, you know, you could have the next Albert Einstein out there, they just don't have the right education or the resources or the internet connection. Simply just that to go out there and explore on their own. But now they're going to have that. So I think that's going to truly revolutionize the world, right? The other thing that I really think technologies like Starlink are going to do is, um, uh, and what I mean by that is CubeSats, because that that is what Starlink is. It's exactly what we're building at at UBC, pretty much, with the exception of uh, we keep our solar panels on the sides and their solar panels extend. (laughs) Nonetheless, um, it's... We'll we'll overlook that. (laughs) (laughs) It's It's going to, I, I think that CubeSat technology, low Earth, uh, low Earth orbit technology, and computers in low Earth orbit are going to open up society's eyes to science too. I think that's a major problem that we still face in society. Like uh, the other day, I was driving by Kitts Beach, and there was a big flat Earth car with you know the big poster slapped up on the side, and like we, you can't, you can only do so much, and you can only implement and argue and debate so much you have to go and show results and i think that technologies like cubesats will allow more people in the future to take photos from space you know by themselves right like um one of the things that we offer is now 
if all things go well, fingers crossed, um, is we'll uh, allow you the opportunity to take a photo of any any place from space on Earth, right? So um, allowing people the opportunity to democratize space. I mean, I mean, yes, but I also think that, you know, so you're thinking of flat Earth, they're, 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 they're you know, or some, somebody who's a conspiracy theorist, they're pretty ingrained in their, in their line of thinking. So I don't think that alone would change it. I think the key what's going to happen is opening up, I mean, assuming we can, we can figure out how to deal with misinformation that's happening on the World Wide Web. But um, uh, misinformation aside, I think education is a really critical component, right? There's, you, you're, you're seeing these, at least right now, we're seeing these, this demographic rural urban divide in cities that's happening. And part of that is demographic, uh, is part of demographic. Part of that is the educational challenges that you're seeing, right? Uh, urban cities have better funded schools. They have better educational programs, right? Rural schools don't have that. And, and that's a bit of a challenge, right? So I think education is really important. It's, it's really the, the foundation of it. And it's something like Starlink will, will provide the ability to, 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 to give high quality education to anybody around the world um now i mean at the end of the day there's still going to be i think skeptics i think you know if i was actually looking at um records of the 1918 pandemic right um and just reading about it and there is a, in, in in vancouver and Kelowna, there was uh masks were mandated right so there were anti-mask protests that you know they were stripping away their liberties and that it was against their freedoms and whatnot. So it's literally a repetition of what we're seeing right now. <laughs> you know, it's, it's <laughs> it didn't really change much. People are going back to the same thing. And, you know, if you kind of look at history, you kind of see what happened back then and what's happening now. And you're like, okay, well, these guys are totally crazy. Right. But I think at the, at the end of the day, it's education is a big, is a big problem, right? A lot of these people, they, they lack the education. They, they look low and they'll invest in their, invest their own time to come, come up with their own conclusions that may or may not be valid, but in their eyes, they're totally valid. So they'll just go with them and they'll argue to death. And, you know, you won't be able to change their mind because they're so uh, entrenched in their line of thinking. So it's, you know, it, high quality education is going to be absolutely key. And if we have platforms to deliver it to rural communities, that's going to be an important, right? Education is always absolutely critical. Totally. No, and I, I, I really think that that's interesting that you said that because um, it's it's it blows my mind how much we've advanced in terms of uh, in terms of science, yet how how much we haven't in terms of social progress, right? Political progress, like. Yeah, I mean, even, like there was a quote by Albert Einstein. I mean, it was referred to warfare, but he said, you know. Um, I don't know how he said, I don't know, something along the lines of, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but something along the lines of, I don't know how World War Three will be fought, but I know that World War Four uh, will be fought with sticks and stones, right? <laughs> so, it's, it's, you know, I think it's something along, along those lines, like, you know, we're going to be stupid enough that, uh, you know, to, to destroy ourselves or to damage our own, our own interest, uh, just for, out of selfish reasons, and then it's going to harm everyone, right? But n- now... And and I think this is a very recent topic too, given uh, Starship's success in the last week or so. I think a lot more people are opening up their eyes to the possibility of maybe going going to Mars and creating a bit of a lifeboat for society. What do you what's your take on that? Oh, I love that. I, I'm all for a space race. I mean. I think a lot of people don't, people who don't support space development, I think they don't understand the benefits that come from, from developing technology towards space. If you look at anything from ballpoint pens to Velcro, those, those simple basic innovations that we use in our day-to-day life, they were made as a result of people striving to go to space and trying to solve problems of how the hell do you write in space when you can't write in space with traditional pens? Oh, let's create a ballpoint pen, you know? So it's, you know, I, I am, I am looking at the list of innovations that we've created to go to space is absolutely insane. I, I, it, it truly blows my mind. I don't even know where to begin, but I think that it, the next, the next stage of the space race, whatever that might look and depending on which countries or companies are involved, right? This might go from a nation to, to a more corporate, uh, fight, but, um, 
I think that's going to bring about a lot of innovation um, that will benefit society. And a lot of that, techno- a lot of the problems that we need to solve to be able to put people on Mars are problems related to terraforming and problems related to how do you actually create a livable atmosphere out of a completely dead rock? So, well, hope, well, maybe completely dead. Okay, I'm not going to go there, but maybe, you know, <laughs> you know, you know but the same, the same challenges that we're facing here with solving climate change, we can fit, those are the same issues that you have to solve if you want to get people on Mars. Do you have to figure out how to terraform Mars? Great. You, you get the, that's literally the, the, the most extreme scenario. And if you can fix Mars, you can fix Earth, right? And if people are pumping billions of dollars into Mars, I think that's a, that's a great and amazing way to, to create new technology because that is 100% R&D. 100% R&D. It's never been done before, right? If you look at something like like renewable energy, yeah, people are striving and they're, you know, they're definitely innovating and whatnot, but a lot of it is just using technology that already exists and some of the edge companies, are, they, you know, they keep producing uh, more or like tweaking uh, their solar panels a little bit and getting those uh, incremental uh, benefits, but they're in small increments. But if you want to go to Mars, you have to make leaps so in those leaves of technology are what I think what we need right now. And is that no, that's 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 so that's very true. I would even I would go as far to say that going to Mars and, and pumping billions of dollars of, of money into uh, one day resettling on a new planet also helps small businesses here on Earth. Because the small businesses here on Earth are the ones that will inevitably be creating the ballpoint pens uh, the if you look at Hasselblad um Hasselblad made the cameras that were taken up on the uh, Apollo 11 missions and um you know Hasselblad was a, was very very small in terms of company size back in 1965 66 but after having the moon camera their revenue jumped uh, their development jumped and they became one of the most expensive cameras to purchase. I am now, maybe not necessarily in that sort of time frame, but I think going to Mars will allow new businesses to pop up, and uh, and you know provide more growth back here on Earth too. No, for sure. I mean, I think yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, you're talking about revenue generation. I mean, definitely revenue growth is important, but I think. I think in the next 20, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, I think for the for the foreseeable future, at least for the next generation, our kids, the biggest challenge is going to be climate change. It's going to require a lot of economic sacrifices for the social good of humanity, right? <laughs> There's You can't have an economy on a dead planet. Um, at the very beginning, I definitely see, you know, at least for the next 30, 40, 50 years, any, any Mars colony is going to be just so dependent on Earth, they're not going to be able to live independently. So this is benefit marginally from 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 their um from supplying products there but i think mostly they're going to benefit from the innovation but i think a really exciting space that i'm specifically around space innovation i'm looking for is is asteroid mining and space mining space manufacturing there's a lot of really cool startups and moonshots that are happening and google's investing a few of them but you know there's so there's quadrillions quadrillions of dollars of resources um out there just floating in space that could be used and could create, you know, factories to mud on asteroids on the moon and in, you know, in orbit to produce products and back to earth. Right. Um, and if you have access to all these resources where extraction is a fraction of a cost that it is here with no, uh, social impact or ecological impact, why wouldn't you want to do that? Right. We are, <laughs> there's, there's countless rocks in space. And at some point, you know, we're, if we want to solve some of the biggest challenges like climate change, we're not going to be able to, I don't believe we're going to be able to solve consumption um, in the short term. Um, I don't think some of these challenges that are, that are that easy to solve, but I think that working towards these innovations of going to space and setting up factories there and asteroid mining and whatnot, I think these are the truly the innovations that are going to help us, you know, fight climate change uh, and develop products at, at a marginal cost um of, of what we're building them on earth now that's assuming you know i'm assuming that there's a lot of assumptions underlying here but assuming this technology is possible we figure out ways you know musk succeeds and you know doesn't die in a catastrophic car accident tomorrow right something along those lines right i'm assuming spacex is going to continue being spacex and be doing a great job but 
you know, you, you never know what may happen, right? Well, you know what? I would argue that we we have we have the te- we have the technology now. Uh, what's it called? Hayabusa two just returned their asteroid sample two weeks ago, maybe. Yeah, but I mean, we're, it's still not at scale. I think it, there, we're definitely lacking scale. Like it's still right. it's too expensive. It's still not sufficient. You know, I was looking. at the cargo prices are still too high. Like they're they're far less. They're not you know hundreds of millions of dollars they were, or even tens of millions of dollars they were a few years ago. You know thousands of dollars now, and and, and they're falling exponentially. But they're still not in the tens of or or even less you know pennies that we need to be able to to do it sustainably and, and affordably. But uh, I think that's going to happen one day. Um, you know we're going to have a pretty big leap, and I definitely think it's you know space innovation is is absolutely fundamental, right? Um, you can talk about, there's just a lot of great companies. My brother works at a really awesome company that's some really cool innovation. They're called Carbonet. And they, they basically created this uh, this proprietary technology, um, this chemical formula. Um, no, I'm not sure exactly what it is. I just know that they can sp- selectively target certain elements in water and filter those out. They can go as far as targeting specific plastics. So they engineer, they engineer their, it's a nanochemical. They engineer the nanochemical to target specific elements. So if you want to extract boron, pour some of their stuff into your water, it'll extract all the boron like foam and then you just scrape it off the top and it's organic and non-toxic, right? So I'm looking at that, I'm like, wow, these guys could be, they have technology to like clean plastics out of water, to literally filter water. I mean, and their method is like a fraction of a cost. Of current methods. So, you know, it's, I think there's a lot of really cool innovations that are happening, but if you want to go to space, you need this in space. Okay. You know, you, this was created by chance in a laboratory somewhere in, in Vancouver, but if you want to go to space, people are going to have to think creatively outside the box. And I think what we need to do is, is to get people to think creatively outside the box. Um, you know, if you're sometimes, sometimes some of the greatest um, inventions have happened accidentally, right? You just created for something else and you use it for, for another use. Like, you know, nobody thought DARPA when they were creating the internet they didn't think the internet is going to be used as what it is. They were like, oh, it's going to be our own communication network. How are we going to spy on people? And now it's it's quite the opposite. Well, I mean, it's still spy on people, but, you know, they didn't, I don't think they ever thought that this would be this information highway that it is right now, right? Oh, no, no, for sure. You know, is that in or if we were to theoretically go to Mars in the next twenty years, I think the only way we'd be able to get there and then come back is um, reset you resource utilization, and a technology like that would help us extract methane from say water ice on Mars's poles, right? Or uh, you know, let's say we're able to get to the Shackleton crater on the moon. If we want to make the fuel to come back, being able to filter out chemicals right out of water is absolutely crucial. So that would be insane. Seeing seeing Earth from outer space, sign me up right now. <laughs> Overlook effect. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they say that uh, if if we were able to send up more politicians into space, that this idea of a globe with borders would slowly fizzle away. Uh, what do you think about that? Do you think we should send all of the politicians up to space? And... <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, let's do it. Why not? It's a good experiment. <laughs> we'll see what happens. I think first politicians and then flat earthers. <laughs> In that order exactly, right? Let's waste our money on them. <laughs> <laughs> we can't uh, legitimize but, uh, them. Yeah, no, but I mean, I, you know, I think it would be great for politicians to go out there and you know, I think there's there's better uses than politicians, but I think you know it's important for people who are developing policy priorities to recognize that certain challenges like climate change, you know, social inequality, and and you know, space are, are all frontiers that they should be investing money into and figuring out these problems because you know these problems are affect, going to be affecting future generations. It's definitely going to become a bigger, bigger challenge now expe- at an exponentially increasing rate. You know. Um, as more young people move into positions of power. So we're seeing that happening with some of the younger prime ministers being elected, like uh, New Zealand, right? New Zealand's now yeah, one of the youngest uh, prime ministers on earth. And um, that's completely changed the way they, they run their government. So I think 
traditionally most government is is older people, right? We're looking at people probably right now they're Gen X and boomers, but we're going to start getting a lot of millennials and then more importantly, Gen Z. So we're, we're about to see a huge transition. There's much, I, I would say there's much more difference now be, between generations than between different nation states. I think that wasn't the case before democratization of technology and the internet and how widespread it was, right? If you look at 50 or 100 years ago, people were pretty much, this is my country, this is my home, you, you know, stay away from me. But the old people kind of found, you know, the, generally, there wasn't that much of a difference between different generations. They, they were kind of, yeah, they had their own disagreements, but generally people were all on the same level. I think now we're seeing, you know, when I, when I meet another young person from a different country, there's, I, I personally feel that there's much less disagreement uh, with them in terms of culture, in terms of life, than there is between uh, uh, different generations. So I think that's going to be really interesting, uh, how that's going to impact society and, and government. You start seeing these generational divides, more so than nation divides in, in decision making. So I think we are going to be more global, especially with a global challenge like, like, uh, like climate change, right? Yeah. No, 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 for sure. And I think this is really reassuring for me coming from somebody like you who works with the the BC Chamber of Commerce, right? You're very ingrained in what I think a lot of people within the scientific and research community would would be the business community, which is almost the polar opposite or has been polar opposites, right? We're we're in the middle, like we're we're, we're not for profit, right? But we're in the middle of business and government uh, and kind of not, not... we are not for profit, but we, you know, we, we I guess we kind of uh, have a foot in the not for profit world. But generally, we're in the middle of business and government, so we get to see kind of the best of both worlds and the worst of both worlds. So it's um, it, it's it's definitely interesting. I think at the end of the day, our goal is to figure out how can we how can we help government change policy to grow the economy and and help support business, right? So it's, it's a balancing act. It's definitely, you know, there's, there's, um, there's, there's some things that we, we recommend that, you know, might be uh, not aligned with government priorities. And, you know, there's some things that might be, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're also interested in how do we, how do we push the laws and, 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 and change the laws so that they help businesses be more innovative, right? Because at the end of the day, it's, it's really the innovation that's, that's going to drive, drive the future, right? And I mean, it's, I, it's clear as to me it's clear as day yeah no 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 for sure see i like going back to what you said you can't put your money on innovation because if you already know what innovation is you know it's not really an innovation but i think yeah, it's trial and error right if you already know like what the next innovation is going to be then i think by definition that's not an innovation because if you know what it is you can build it today right but mm-hmm. an innovation is like completely new and novel something nobody has come up with so you know if you don't if you the next innovation you can you will be able to i think kind of understand what field it'll come in and what it'll kind of generally accomplish but i don't think you you know exactly how to get there right like we we can tell right now that there's going to be innovation in space travel to mars or you know how they you know decontaminate the soil Mars, but anything concrete, we have no freaking idea. I have right. no fucking clue how they're going to solve that, right? Yeah, because if I knew, it would not be an innovation at this point. So, yeah. But for everyone who wants to invest in stocks, space is a good call, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, well, yeah, I mean, I hope we're going to see a lot more uh, space companies going public. Um, it's going to be a huge field. Uh, space race is going to be, yeah, it's going to be really exciting. So next next step, I think, is going to be uh, we have the decriminalization of drugs. So psychedelics, I think, are going to be a big field. Um, but then after that, I think we're going to see definitely a boom in uh, hopefully, well, hopefully a boom in space. Well, we saw that here in Vancouver just, what, maybe a month ago when they decriminalized a, a lot of drugs. I don't know if it's all drugs, but... They didn't de- decriminalize the drugs, actually. They... Uh, uh, they passed a motion to ask the federal government to decriminalize drugs. The, the municipal government actually doesn't have the power to, to decriminalize drugs in Vancouver, so they didn't decriminalize any drugs. Nothing actually changed. See, and you know what? I've just been a victim of uh, fake news. Clickbait tuttles. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you got to really read into it and read the details. But yeah, if you just look at the, at the headlines, I think the headlines were 
um, that Trump's got decriminalized or something. But no, Vancouver wants to, and they've asked the federal government, but Trudeau, I'm not sure if he'll approve it. I think before his stance was that they wouldn't, but um, who knows, you know, maybe maybe he's changed. So, so far at your time working with the BC Chamber of Commerce, though, would you say that you've seen a tremendous amount of change in terms of how much we've innovated in terms of just a just as a, as a society right well i mean that's a that's pretty broad comment to make uh, i mean as an organization we definitely innovate and i've seen government go through a lot of innovation definitely in the past two years especially with the pandemic right uh, being a year of it so i definitely see a lot more innovation happening in government and it's kind of not for profit sector which is really exciting because you know gov tech you know you know, a lot of people aren't really interested in that, but you know, if government has innovation, it really, it really drives society forward, because in many cases, government's really slowing us down, unfortunately. But um, I think it's a really exciting time for uh, for these like late adopters of technology. You know, we're not necessarily the, t- the trailblazers that that you know you have your startups at Y Combinator are really, you know, creating the next wave of of billion and maybe even trillion dollar companies, but uh, I think these smaller innovations that people generally don't see are are going to be just as important in your day-to-day life, right? Well, uh, if we get our hands on those asteroids, I think there's going to be a couple trillionaires out there, to say the least. Oh, yeah, for sure, yeah. I mean, um, but no, that is is extremely reassuring to hear because, uh, you know, people like you are the type of people that we really need to get in power, right? It's, It's this idea that science and technology are more important than traditional economics, which, I mean, coming from by my bias, right, is, I... Well, I mean, we do a lot of economic development, right? I mean, I think, you know, I think a lot of economic models are, are flawed, but um, in practice, when you actually, you know, try the trial by fire, they don't quite hold up. But, um, you know, I think technology innovation is going to be absolutely important. I think every every organization, every company is now a tech company and, and, and even more so they're a data company if they just don't know it yet, right? You can't build technology without good data and you can't make good decisions without good data. So I think um, it's, it's a truly the danger mining factor for any organization out there. Every tech company or every company out there is a tech and data. That's well said. <laughs> that is well said. Every, every company is a, is, a, is a tech company and every every tech company is a data company, right? Because you can't build good tech without good data. That's true. And and hopefully with quantum computing and AI, more, uh, more innovation will lead better results. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, hey, it's been really good talking to you, Georgie. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about okay. all this. Thanks for having me, Ethan. Dude, anytime.